name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus, you are never reluctant to make us uncomfortable as you call us to be your light in the broken places we live. Your call is to grow and expand our vision and to live out your healing law of love. We are grateful, for you are with us always and ready to give us the courage to open our hearts and the strength to respond by working together to build a world of justice and mercy. We open our hearts to you to hear your word and accept it and live it out. Thank you, risen Lord, for nailing our sins to the cross and empowering us through the Holy Spirit to do your will. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, For everybody's information, we are going to make one change to the agenda this morning. Uh, we'd like for uh, Jim Cobalt to present the uh, crime statistics before we get into the new business, because uh, the new business that we're going to talk about, the discussion of the ramifications of AB 109 and the uh, ordinance related to registered sex offenders uh, are related to the statistics. So we'd like to hear the statistics first, then we'll go to uh, the new business when we get to that, when we get to that point. Um, and then we'll just continue from there with the rest of the rest statistics and the rest of the agenda as published. Uh, presentations, uh, today we have none, is that correct? So we'll move to public business from the floor, agendized items. We have no speaker cards. So we go to the consent Calendar approval of the minutes of January 11th, 2012. Do I have a motion? I'll second. Okay, it's been moved and second. Discussion? All in favor? Passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Okay, so now we're going to move on to, as I stated earlier, uh, commission staff presentations, and I'll turn uh, the floor over to Jim Cobalt. Thank you, Commissioner Fuller. Uh, the uh, measurement period that we're looking at today is January 8th to February 4th, 2012. In these four weeks, um, we, we saw some interesting uh, issues with regard to Part 1 crimes. Um, we generally like to be in that 50 to 50 to 60-ish range of Part 1 crimes. We achieved that in three of these four weeks. Um, the one week from uh, January 15th to the 21st, uh, we seem to hit about 88, and uh, not real sure why that is. Uh, you can see it's, it's distributed amongst the violent crimes and the property crimes, so not real sure what was going on there yet. We haven't really looked at the data that closely. Uh, our arrests remain kind of in that, that 175 to, to 240 range. Uh, of course, week five up there, uh, the date is incomplete at this point. This was some good news for us uh, from the last reporting period. In January, we reported our weekly average for Part 1 crimes was 74.25 with a median of 74.5. We dropped down a little bit during this reporting period, and we're hitting a uh, weekly average now of 71. Bear in mind that one week really drove up the average because when you're, when you're doing the average, you're taking the total and dividing it by the, by the number of weeks. But the, in, in, to my feeling, the, the, uh, um, the measurement that's a little more accurate is the uh, median, and that's 68. One of the things that we did this, this particular reporting period, as opposed to uh, what we normally do, uh, we, have, we have some other issues that we're dealing with right now. So one of the things that we wanted to look at was what are the characteristics of the folks that we arrest in the city of Lancaster? And what we were looking at is there are several data points that we connect after the arrest takes place and after the uh, before we enter it into our arrest database 
And a couple of those data points are, are uh, whether or not somebody's on probation, whether or not somebody's on parole, and whether or not somebody has a prior criminal record. And we check everybody who goes through or who's entered into the system for that so that we can get a clear idea of exactly who we're dealing with and, and what the characteristics are of the folks that, that end up being arrested. This particular measurement period is from May 1st to December 31st of 2011. What we looked at was the, the first variable that we looked at were persons that were arrested with a criminal history. That represented reliably 36% of all of our arrests. Now when I say reliably, what we did was, besides simply figuring an average, we, we broke all of the arrests down by month, and then we ran a scatter plot on it, which, which showed us if arrests went up, how correspondingly did the arrest for this category go up, or if arrests went down, how correspondingly did they go down? Then to validate what we were seeing in the scatter plots, we ran what, uh, a formula that's called a Pearson R. Pearson R is typically used to measure uh, different pieces of data and their correlation to each other. And what we found in each of these categories was a very strong uh, correlation statistically. So we're pretty confident in our numbers. The next level that we looked at were probationers. Probationers accounted for about 22% of our total arrests. And as the number moved, this number stayed constant. So we were, we were, we were confident with this number as well. Then when we come to parolees, we find out that 10% of our arrests are parolees. So as you look at the numbers up here, we have, a, we have a significant number of folks that get arrested that fall into these three categories. And then the other folks would fall into categories that, that uh, are measured different ways and those kinds of things. Yeah. Yes, sir. Jim, is, is that considered for violations or is that for new crimes? For the parolees and probationers, parolees are the folks that that one of the things that we do is we have we have folks that check the criminal justice systems to determine whether or not somebody's on parole at the time that they were arrested. This check occurs within a day or two after the arrest occurs. So if they showed to be on parole at the time that they were checked, then we check the box on our uh, on our booking slip. So we don't know if it's a new crime or if it's just a violation. Don't know if it's a new crime or a violation. Now, we could sort that out in the data. We have the capability to do that. But that was not the purpose of this particular study. Okay. And also, does, does that include post-release? All it would show, the, the only thing that we, we collect is whether or not they are on parole. I don't know. No, I mean for the probationers, because post-release is being supervised by probation now. So yes. That... If they showed to be on county probation, then, then they, uh, they, the box was checked off. But is, is that considered post-release, though? Are, they, are you separating that? from? No, we're not. So they're considered probationers, the post-release? Anybody who would show in the county probation system would be, would be considered on probation. Okay. Is there any way to track post-releases? There might be, but uh, I, uh, I, again, we'd have, to, we'd have to coordinate that with the station. As we take a look at, I guess before we move on to this, any, any other comments on it, concerns? Okay. For us, that was kind of, those, these were kind of significant findings because we'd never been able to answer these questions before because in most of the, most of the data sets that we use, the, there's not usually a correlation or, or any kind of cross-check of the different databases. So uh, when we started this, um, last year, it was it was uh, it was interesting for us to look at and, and, and see exactly what some of the characteristics are of the people that we're arresting. When we take a look for this reporting period, and we take a look at the reporting districts that that um, had the highest frequency of Part One crimes, at least the good news when we take a look at these particular numbers up here right now is. In previous months, one of the things that we frequently see are multiple reporting districts with the same number. We're not seeing that now. So as we look at the top five, we're truly looking at five reporting districts as opposed to six or seven that share the same numbers. 
11.37 obviously led the way with 40, followed by 11.32 with 33, 11.35 with 31, uh, 11.27 with 26, and 11.21 with 23. I think for, for the sake of expediency today, we're going to to not look at each individual characteristics. The individual maps are on the, the uh, city's web page as part of this presentation if somebody wants to take a look at that and drill down a little bit further. Um, what I'd like to get to right now are what we're seeing in terms of what's trending up and what's trending down right now. As we take a look at this, burglary was in this category last week. The, the positive thing about burglary as we take a look at this is we have, in the last 52 weeks, we've, we have four weeks where we actually got over our baseline. And remember, our baseline is our average, uh, and we average about 24.13 uh, burglaries in the city of Lancaster. We're, so for all of the other weeks, we're still under our baseline. We do show a, a upward trend right now. Primarily the reason for that is because, as we saw at the end of, of, of last year, we had five of the last six months that had quantitative numbers that were higher than 2010. That is reflected in some of these data because, or, or some of these data, because as those quantitative numbers were a little bit higher, we tend to see that on the right side of this graph from about midway on over to the to the far right. That's where we see that upswing reflected just a little bit. Same principle applies with larceny. We can see that there were only a few weeks that we actually broke through that blue line right there. The baseline for larceny is 40.86. And as we take a look at that, <clears throat> we can see the majority of the activity is below there. One of, the, one of the problems that we have when it comes to larceny is we used to have some really low weeks. For example, if you look at that, that week that's around week 24 or 25, um, you, you can see we, we have the big dip down there, and we had a lot of weeks that were really low. As we get closer to the end of the year, as we move to the right side of the graph, you can see there was really one, maybe two weeks where we had those dip downs that were really low. And then we kind of stayed up just a little bit. And again, this gets into the, to the data that we were seeing as we looked at part one data and compared it 2011 to 2010. Grand Theft Auto appears to be trending up as well. Again, some of the issues with Grand Theft Auto is the same thing. If you look at the, at the left side of the graph up there, the, the early part of last year, you can see we had far more frequent um, lower points in the graph than we have on the right side of the graph. Arson, um, low frequency crime, you have a few and, and, and it spikes it up. The, uh, the positive thing about this, this particular presentation as well is we don't have anything really that's trending flat this time. We're either up or we're down. Uh, and we had one more category this time that we were down in that we, did, we had last time, so that's a positive thing. Rape, again, a low-frequency crime, but we are trending down in that. Robbery, uh, there's really a very nice positive downward slope there. You can see on the right side, remember previously in the other slides we talked about on the right side and those, those low levels that really tend to bring that, that green trend line down. Well, if you look over on the right side of that, you can see that we have some really good low levels. Like if you get to about week 47, you can see we were down to like one robbery. I mean, that's, that's, those are good numbers for us, especially when our baseline is around six. Assault also shows uh, a nice downward slope there. You can see our baseline clear up there at the top, right below the number 16. That, as that goes across, and you can see the trend line is down just above 8, and it's coming down and joining 8 as you get to the right side of the graph. And then, of course, this is the map that's, uh, that's included on the uh, website. Uh, these are our uh, spatial trend analysis when we compare January's data to December. The red areas are areas where we spiked up in the city. The green areas are where we, where we uh, showed a positive decline. This is our forecast for uh, February of 2012. 
with a breakdown by reporting district and, and estimated frequencies. And uh, this is our call for service chart looking back over 52 weeks. Uh, you can see that we're running pretty flat right now, which is much better than we were doing at the probably at the beginning, beginning of summertime. Beginning, beginning of summertime, I think I expressed my concern to the council or to the uh, commission that we uh, that we were seeing an upward tick in uh, calls for service. But you can see now we've kind of leveled out, and that green line going across is what our trend line is right now for calls for service, looking at 52 weeks. As we look at repeat calls for service uh, for the four weeks, the locations that had 10 or more calls for service during this particular lo or this particular time increment, uh, obviously Antelope Valley Hospital leads the way. Again, the reason for that is there are certain things that they're required by law from the emergency room to call the police or, or the sheriff's department on, so they, they are uh, following their legal mandates followed by Friendly Village Mobile Home Park at 1301 East Avenue I, uh, Briarwood Mobile Home Park at 45800 Challenger Way, Walmart West at 4466-5 uh, Valley Central Way, Morrell's Group Home. Uh, I looked at the uh, call for service data on this. Morrell's Group Home was having a, a uh, problem with a particular youth and that one particular youth was mentioned in virtually all of the calls for service. So apparently they're struggling trying to get a handle on, on that particular young man. 1731 East Avenue J, uh, Walmart East, Rancho Mirage Mobile Home Park, 43850 20th Street East. And one that popped up that, that hasn't been on here in a while is the 7-Eleven store at 844 East Avenue J. And that takes care of my report. I have a question for you. Sure. The, uh, the, the stats came out this week about our crime rate being down for the year, but every every month we come here, they all seem to be going up. How yeah, do we the, for that? The, the explanation for that is pretty simple. We got a really nice benefit from the, um, from the uh, uh, Census Bureau about May of last year. They estimated our population to be uh, a little over 156. Previous to that, we'd been estimating around 144, 145. So when you add that population onto the frequency, and you and you factor your crime rate using that increased population, even though we sustained an increase in frequency, we were able to weather it. Now the the issue that we come down to in this is, once we hit May of of this coming year we won't have the same benefit from that frequency because it will have already been in place. The only way that, we'll, the only way that we would benefit from it is if we get an actual count. My suspicion is the, one of the factors that are, that are factoring into the increase in frequency is that as we continue to repopulate, we are probably adding population. I don't know where it's coming from, but we are probably doing it. One of the other, or a couple other measurements that I look at are the number of, of licenses that we issue out of finance and what the, what the exit ramps tell us off of the 14, because the state puts that on the, uh, on the, uh, uh, the uh, website for the state. And our crime rate and the, and the arc that it gives almost goes hand in hand with those other data points. And, and so I, my, my feeling is we may be feeling an increase in population. Now the, the challenge for the city is this, to hold the Department of Finance accountable to make sure that we get an accurate count of our population because if the, par if the Department of Finance underestimates us the way they did the last four to six years in the 2000s, then we're going to see a problem again. But if we get proper rec recognition for the population that we have, then our, then our crime rate is reasonable. So, so if we use the population in, those, in, the, in the stats, our, our crime rate would have been up? If we would have used the crime or, or the population that we estimated it against in the first five months, yes, our crime rate would have been up. Okay. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, just can I, I'm sorry, okay. just to make a point on that. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, is, if you look, you still need to look at our baseline. Okay, that baseline was still established based on that 
population rate, and we're still underneath that. So, yes, we trend that up, and I know the captain's going to probably discuss on how he visits that continually with his staff. The point being is the baseline's established over a period of time that's long term. Okay, so that takes us back even beyond 10 years. Okay, so as long as we feel that we're operating under that baseline, that's what matters here, okay? We need to address the things week to week as, a, as allocation of resources deal with specific issues that, it come, that come up. At the same time, though, we're still operating under that baseline. That's an average of what we project over a 10-year period. I guess my point is, is it, it, we can move that line anywhere we want and still look good. Is that what we're doing? No. You know, from a public safety standpoint, I think there gets to be a little confusion with crime rate and net crime. And one of the things that I think the public needs to be aware of is that the net amount of crimes has continually reduced. Yeah, there's fluctuations between the 52 weeks and every four weeks, but at the end of the day, we had much fewer crimes in 2011 compared to 2010. So the crime rate is fluctuated based on the population, as Jim spoke of. But the net number is what people should be concerned with, because with that increase in population, it's pretty impressive that we had fewer actual crimes occur, and that is what I want people to look at, the number of actual crimes that occurred, and there were fewer crimes in 2011 compared to 2010. But like, for example, the robbery, the robbery went up. That was, that was for the whole year, correct? Yeah. yeah. What, you, what you have to robbery, understand. Robbery was the only category in the city that had an increase in actual crime. Yeah, what, what you have to what you have to consider is, you can look at it a variety of ways, and and we tend to look at it at the city level, in weekly increments and and over the over the course of of an entire year, the sheriff's department tends to look at it monthly and quarterly, which is which is the way that their data sets go. What we're looking for in the numbers are what the trends are telling us and whether we're trending up or whether we're trending down. What the captain says is correct. What we have to understand about the year 2011 is we had a really low frequency first half of the year. Our last half of the year was not quite as generous with the numbers. And that's, that's why when I say when we hit May of this year, we could have a little bit of an issue. Uh, but again, it's 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 not just on the back of the sheriff's department. It's also our population has to be estimated correctly. Because if it's not, then we take a beating for it when it's when it's not justified. Right. Uh, I get a lot of phone calls, and there's a consensus out there that that the, the numbers are fudged because they see this that it's going up all the, every every month. So I mean, that's why I'm bringing this up. I mean, th is there checks and balances so that we know that these numbers aren't fudged? I, 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 I guess I don't understand what you're asking. Like I'm saying, w w our crime rate would have went up if we didn't move a certain bar. Who moved that bar? The uh, population bar. The popul The United States Census Bureau. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and and that's that's the way that the the data are reported to the Uniform Crime Report of the FBI. I mean, population when you figure crime rate. Crime rate. It, you, you must distinguish between crime rate and crime frequency. Crime frequency are the actual number of crimes. Crime rate are those crimes factored against the population. And so we figure our crime rate by 10,000. So you take your crime frequency, you divide it by your population, and then multiply it by 10,000. That's, that is the way that you figure your crime rate. That's not crime frequency. What you see up here is crime frequency, not crime rate. And so you end up with, you can end up with a trend line that reflects that you're going up. Remember, that's a trend line. It's not, it, 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 it's not an absolute given that in any particular time increment you're going to go up. It's a trend line. It says these are what the data are saying. And so, you know, I mean, I'm sorry if somebody feels like it's fudged, but, you know, I mean, if you, if you understand statistics, you understand what's going on. I'm just trying to get a feel, or, you know, explaining it better so that everybody understands it. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's the problem that we're I understand. having out there. Um, also, the, the, we used to go by a number that 3.0 and 3 was, was good or bad. Are we using that number anymore, uh, the, the crime rate per 10,000, you said? 
There was a uh, 300, 300 per 10,000 was the goal, but we hit we hit about 260. We did. Okay, good. Yeah. But we uh, again, we've been. I, I mean, the point that the captain makes is really valid. I mean, our population went up, but frequency overall is down. Okay. I mean, that's that's a good thing. But the other thing that I think we're seeing a little bit of within the scope of that is we're seeing a little bit a little bit of an increase in owner occupied residences uh, in the in the city we're beginning to see a little bit of a positive movement in that direction any time that you increase your owner occupied versus versus rental the uh, uh, you're going to see probably some positive swings in these numbers okay thank you very much no comment uh, yeah just just a comment Get your mic again. Is, it on? Mm -hmm. is it on yeah yeah uh, to, to play Forrest Gump here what I heard, I think, was that we have a growth in population from 2010 to 2011 and that the total number of crimes is down. Just Comparably yes no for the year, it's down, yes. Okay. Thank you. Well, and from my perspective, your, your crime rate and uh, frequency reports are basically represent a report card. It tells us at the end of the day whether we did well or we didn't do it well. But we all know from our experience in school that, you know, the report card's one thing, but the preparation and the study that you do to get that good grade is really what's most important. So to see that, uh, how crimes are distributed in the community, and to leave it at uh, face value and say, well, it's up this week or it's down that week, to me really has limited benefit, unless there's the analysis that goes behind it and says, so what? You know, well, why is that? Who's doing it? So when I see the type of in-depth analysis, actually outstanding analysis that was presented at the beginning of this presentation, talking about the deep dives that go into those statistics and identifying who's to blame for that allows you then to develop a strategic response. And then that's the studying, in my perspective, uh, for the test. We should see the exam scores later uh, based on what it is that, and how we respond, certainly, but that, uh, to me, that's what's encouraging, that uh, you, you've built up enough data at this point where you can really make some, some uh, educated guesses based on outstanding information and then see whether or not your assumptions are correct based on the, uh, the strategies that you develop. So um, to me, that's encouraging. We'll see how that plays out in the numbers when the report cards come in on a monthly basis, but uh, to hear about what it is that we're gleaning from the data, and I, and I don't expect to be discussed in this room what we're doing about it. Uh, that would sort of be, we can talk about it after it's happened. Obviously, that's better. Uh, but I'd, I'd just like to uh, compliment you on the, on the analysis that's being done. I think that every month it gets better and better asking the question of, so what? And that's really what the most important thing is. Well, I, I think the, the really important recognition for this is to realize we're the only contract city in Los Angeles County that can answer these questions. Everybody else has to rely on somebody else to tell them. The city of Lancaster digs into this information and comes up with these answers with the assistance of the sheriff's department on this side so that we can understand from a management perspective about what we need to do to be able to put the resources in the right places. There are no other contract cities in the city of, Lan or the city of Los Angeles County or in a Los Angeles County that can answer these questions or or uh, do these kind of analyses. Well, to see the, tra the trends uh, going down is encouraging. I think everybody in the community and certainly this group of people would respond positively to that. But uh, the bottom line is you have no control over who's going to assault who from day to day, especially when it's uh, the one-off situation uh, where somebody decides they're going to be bad that day or doesn't decide but circumstances dictate it. But when you can look at trends and identify groups of individuals or individuals themselves who tend to be behind a certain percentage of, uh, of these crimes and then target uh, appropriately those actions, I think that that's all we can expect. It, it puts us into being proactive rather than reactive, and whenever you're in that mode, uh, I think you're better off. So thank you very much, I and mean, I appreciate the work you're doing. Do we have any other comments from commissioners? Okay, well, thank you again for that, that presentation. Uh, outstanding job, as always. I'm going to move back into the agenda, as I discussed earlier, going to new business. Uh, point NB1, discussion of ramifications of AB 109. 
Consideration of recommendation of the City Council regarding this subject. And I think, uh, Commissioner Gapel, you were... Yeah, I asked for this to be on the uh, on the agenda here after we talked to probation last uh, last month about some of the things that was happening. Um, in parole, we're seeing a trend of different things, and, and uh, I wanted to bring some of the things up so that we can get a handle on it and maybe bring it up to the higher echelon. Um, one of the things I want to bring up is is about parole. Two years ago, on uh, in January 2010, we spoke about NRP, the non-revocable parole. Um, that took effect in January 2010. That took all the non-violent, non-serious, non-sexual people off of parole. Once that, once that, th those were the true non-non-nons. They did not have any of that in their background whatsoever. All of those people went off parole. They had no conditions of parole, and they um, were only subject. It was like a summary probation where you were you were only subject to search. So as of today, we don't we do not have any NRPs on our caseloads. We have approximately 40,000 parolees in Los Angeles County. We have approximately 1,800 here in the Antelope Valley. Um, so what I want to bring up about that is, is with AB 109, we do not have any non-non-nons on parole. However, the problems that we're having with that now is if you commit an offense while you're on parole, if you commit an offense, let's say burglary, that is a non-non-non, the person will get off a of parole now for committing a new crime. And that is, that, that is, that is a loophole that we did not foresee. So, um, and we're seeing this, uh, for example, we had a person on December 20th rob one of our local stores, or burglarize one of our stores. He was caught that day. He was sentenced to 180 days of, uh, with a new felony. He was sentenced 180 days. He was out in 20 days, and he was off parole. So he was able to commit a crime, Get off parole, and as we saw last month, if you get on if you get on post release, you don't have to worry about going back to jail because they're not going to violate you. So everybody on parole right now is looking to commit crimes so that they can get off of parole and on post release. And the biggest factor that we have on this too is if we have a sex offender. We have 177 on parole out here in, the, in Antelope Valley. There are two tiers of sex offenders. One is uh, the low level, and the other was the high level. If you're categorized as low level, which we have approximately 100 of those, if you're categorized as, as, as low level, you're on parole for five years, you are, you, you, and you have, you're required to wear GPS. If you're wearing GPS, they do not like that. The parolees do not like that. So if a sex offender wants to go out and commit a crime now, he can go burglarize one of our, one of our uh, community uh, businesses. That person will get off a of parole, will not, have to, will not have to wear GPS anymore, and they will be off parole within one year. By law, they have to get off a of parole in one year if they don't violate, and we already know they're not violating. So there's an incentive for sex offenders to, get off of, to go commit crimes in our community and get off a of parole. So I would... Uh, my point to bring this up today is we need to, we, we need to do something, um, possibly as a city, as, as elected officials, uh, have a commission put forward to amend AB 109, or do something as far as the, especially the sex offenders. But but it goes farther. Every like I was saying with the non-revocable parolees, by 2014, by 2014, all of our parolees, well, 40, 40,000, they estimate 8,000 to be on parole. So that means 32,000 parolees that are that are violent, they either have a violent, a serious, or a, or a sex offense, will be on post-release. And they want to tell us that that every everybody is everybody that's going to post-release is non-violent, which is not true. These people have a very violent back, uh, very violent criminal history. So we need to do something. Um, I'm up for suggestions for what we can do. Uh, I know. Uh, City Councilman Chris was uh, interested in this, and I, you know, I bring it up for for you know consultation. What do we want to do if we want to do anything? I know uh, people probably think I'm biased. I'm on parole, but I, I have an inside look at what's happening, and, and crime is going to go up. Can I just throw something out for thought then, as I talked to Commissioner Capel about this in the past? You know, one of the considerations for reevaluation when they went to NRPs for non revocable parole is initially they released or scheduled to release certain individuals and said they were only going to use their last offense for consideration. And later that was changed to include past history. And I think that's probably something that 
for purposes of discussion is to talk about. If they were able to amend that for NRPs, why couldn't we apply the same criteria here as for uh, N3s or this post-release issue? So maybe that's something for consideration, because as probation indicated in their presentation, they were only going to consider their last offense that they were incarcerated for, whereas with NRPs, they do look into their history. And so if they have a history of violence or serious offenses, they cannot be in an NRP. I don't know why that would not apply here or something we could certainly pursue. The question is, what do we do about it? Well, that, we do anything that's what I'm saying. If they've already set a precedent, it's precedent setting that they did do the reconsideration as it related to non-revocable parole. I, I certainly would believe now, because they did do that and amend that, why that criteria would be so difficult to apply here. That's the only reason I'm throwing that. There's a precedent for it. Comments. I'm not sure what we can do about an assembly bill as far as that's concerned. If you want to make a recommendation to the City Council, perhaps um, if we could seek to have you on their agenda just to discuss the issue and bring it up at that level. I, know, I don't know at this level what we would be able to do, if anything, other than to be aware and see how that reflects in our crime statistics. I... <clears throat> I did talk to Mr. Capel in regards to this uh, when he brought it to my attention about a month ago. Uh, I did talk to Senator Runner's office in regards to it, but it wouldn't hurt if the Criminal Justice Commission made a recommendation that the City Council take a good look and get a uh, letter from the City Council that would say that we need to amend this policy because it is an incentive for criminals out there to commit crimes to get off of probation. Well, I, I would certainly uh, entertain a motion to do that, to uh, recommend to the City Council that, uh, that they take a little closer look at the ramifications. Um, as stated, you know, uh, Jim, if you, wanted to, if you wanted to make that motion, we'll see what yeah, I, uh, I I feel we need to do something. I mean, the, the crime is going to crime is going to spike. Um, I, I have a good, you know, I, I I talk to parolees every day, and uh, they tell me it's a good time to be a criminal. Okay. Yeah, so we need to. Can yeah. I just pipe in just for a moment? The, uh, it may be a good time to be a criminal, but I'll tell you, it's not a good time in Lancaster to be a criminal. Uh, a lot of the things that are going on, especially with the PSPs, we get the report each week of the amount of PSPs that have been released in the city of Lancaster as well as the unincorporated area. We have teams addressing those PSPs as well as the parolees, but specifically with the PSPs. We're well aware of their capability and the uh, motivation individuals may want, have to commit crimes. But that's exactly why we put the robbery suppression team in place, the burglary suppression team. They've had a very high success rate in catching these individuals. So they will get caught if they commit the crime. Yes, they may have some benefit, uh, the outcome, which we can't control at this moment. But as soon as they get put on PSP, we'll be going out and visiting them again to make sure they're in compliance with the law. But another problem, another problem with AB 109 is the fact that nobody's getting any jail time. We, we have people that have possession of methamphetamines. They get a new charge. They, they get time served, and then they're off parole, and now they're on post-release with nobody checking them, which we, last, last month, they were pretty clear that nobody's going to jail anymore. Two people in, in, two people in L.A. County got revoked on post-release, two, which is we do that before 8 o'clock in the morning every day in parole. So, I mean, there's, there's a huge incentive. They know there's no ramifications now. If you go burglarize one of our community stores, you're going to get 20 days. People know that now, and that's what they're getting. Um, another aspect is, is one that we have to worry about here as soon as the jails uh, fill up. Kern County, Kern County, the most a parole violator will do is 20 days. In Fresno County, they're full. They will not take any parole violators. So if you have a sex offender in, in Fresno that is on drugs and, and living with a kid, you can't violate that person. That's a scary situation. And that, that's if the jails fill up here, we'll have that same problem. And, and on parole violations, that's what we're getting here about. About 20 to 30 days is about all they're doing because the jails are full. So they're, like I said, they're, 
All the criminals are laughing at us right now because they can do what they want and they know there's no ramification except for maybe a month of, of jail time. So we can put all the, we could put all our resources to go catch these guys, but they're back out within within a month, and that's a problem. Mr. Chairman, if I could make just <clears throat> one brief comment, please. I do think that um, the uh, what the legislature has deemed um, non-serious uh, crimes needs to be examined in and of itself. I can give you a very good example, and I, I'm sure that the captain from the CHP would, would agree with me. The, your fourth-time DUI um, defendant, it's 23153. They have indicated that's non-serious, non-violent, obviously non-registrable. Um, so now we're in the DA's office. I'm almost put in a position now of putting those people, which were traditionally always in the state prison, on probation because they'll actually get more supervision on a probationary status than they would be um, if they were just sentenced to local custody prison time where they do their time and then they're released and they're and they're off parole as you've appropriately indicated so I think some of these crimes that's a perfect one that should be deemed I think serious because we all know in this room that if you've picked up a fourth DUI within 10 years, you're very liable to uh, do some serious injury to, uh, to an individual. Uh, another crime, obviously, that they've considered to be non-serious is sale of narcotics. Well, it, we all know that's extremely dangerous by its very nature. So some of that, I think, needs to be looked at where these people should be once convicted, actually put in state prison and not doing their prison time in local custody. I think that would be a, a benefit that some of these crimes need another look at for the for these purposes. Right. We're also having, you know, a huge problem out here is the sex offenders. And we have some of the problems that we're having is, is you can have child pornography on your computer, and that's non-sexual now. So a sex offender can have child pornography and not go to state prison for that. You'll go to, you'll go to post-release for that. And that's, or failure to register a sex offense. You can have the worst guy in the world, which is categorized low, of course, which was you know, like Garrido. He was, he was categorized as low. So if he had done something, had child pornography, he would have been on post-release. And that's some of the problems that we're having, that, that these guys are figuring out ways to get off of parole and ways to get around the system that they're not being, they're not being uh, checked. One thing that I think we can immediately do is uh, what we found out when we went to Ontario, the post-release sex offenders are on GPS, and, and our county's not doing that. It's something that we can bring up and find out why we're not doing that. Well, it's, a, it's an interesting discussion. It's certainly worth, worthy of our time, um, but I'm wondering if you have a, a recommendation to the City Council that you could put in the form of a motion. Yeah, I, I'd like to recommend that we take it to the City Council and ask for a commission or a, some form to be done. I, I would be, I, I know, do, do we need a sponsor for that, Mr. Uh, Chris? Did no, you can, you can do that like it is, but if you're going, that's what this commission is, is for, is to, you know, if you're going to make recommendations to the City Council, then, you know, come up with some recommendations. You're, you're identifying the problems. What are your recommendations, you know, for the City Council, and what can we do to alleviate? We've heard that, you know, they need to take a look at the classifications. You know, certainly our Sheriff's Department is doing what they're supposed to be doing, and it's, uh, uh, it's somewhere upstream that the problem is, but what is the recommendation and what would the recommendation of the Criminal Justice Commission, not necessarily a new commission, to, to do it? That's what you guys are tasked to do. I would, I would say we, we'd recommend to the City Council to take a look at, to, to, to take a look at uh, presenting something to the, to the Senators or uh, to the upper echelon to actually get a uh, AB 109 amended. Well, I think what uh, Councilman Chris' point is, however, that uh, rather than ask them to, to look at it, um, it would be probably more appropriate for us to do that. So within the Criminal Justice Commission, to actually formulate a recommendation that's more substantial than it should be looked at, but rather uh, it's the uh, our opinion that we should do X, Y, and Z, or the city should consider doing certain things with specificity. Um, and I don't think that can be done in today's meeting. Right. So, so should we, uh, I recommend putting a committee together to, 
to present to the uh, city council? I think that's fine. Or what we could do would be uh, perhaps, I mean, you certainly have given it a lot of thought, and you're closest to the issue, I believe, of any of the commissioners. But if you wanted to put together a presentation uh, for next month, for example, that we could discuss and come up with some recommendations, that might work as well. It seems like some of our task force take a long time to come up with what we sort of intuitively know. And uh, given your day job, you're uniquely uh, in the position to come up with some recommendations that we could discuss in public and, and then get any input from anyone who might want to come and uh, chime in on that with, you know, after it's been advertised that we're going to have the meeting. Okay, so, so we put that on the agenda, and I'll put, give a presentation next next uh, month. I'm a Everybody. firm believer not to kick the can down the road, okay? Right. And that's what we're doing. So we need to do something as soon as possible on it. So my recommendation to you would be why don't you uh, put together a recommendation and, with, uh, and set together with Mr. Fuller and get together with the DA on the different changes, what we think, and so we can what we can take to the assemblyman, what we can take to the senator, and with the recommendation of the city council and the criminal justice commission, these are the factors, these are what ha is happening, and these are the changes that we need. We already know what those are, but if you guys put them down and make that recommendation, I think that's what we need. Well, so let's not kick the can down the road. You can go ahead and do it now, but and then you can make the presentation to the city council. Well, I, I think it's in essence what I'm suggesting, but in terms of uh, I'm not so sure the can's uh, in, in position to be kicked yet, uh, but if we do that at our next meeting, that's that's pretty pretty quick. That's, we only meet once a month. I don't think that from what I'm hearing that we're in a position today to clearly articulate that, but we would be by the next meeting. Plus, I would like to get input from other organizations, too. Uh, I mean, I'm coming up from my department, but there's other organizations that are involved that they may want to change AB 109 also. So so if we could contact, you know, like the DA's office, probation, the sheriff's department, everybody can have input to it, then we could recommend it to the city council. Okay. Mr. Mr. Chairman, may I throw some at, uh, Mr. Franklin already provided a list based on your instructions to your staff on what cases will be filed and recommendations for state prison. Maybe maybe we can go revisit that list, and I can do that with uh, Commissioner Capel, and we can make a meeting with Mr. Franklin to go through that list to see what he feels strongly needs to be readdressed, and we can be specific about what crimes that that based on the uh, the um, rec the regulations of this assembly bill, what need to be revisited as far as crimes would be for consideration for recommendation to state prison beyond the scope of this program. And then maybe as that relates also, Commissioner Capel's uh, issues regarding where we have gaps as it relates to specifically like 290 offenders and, and, and put that in a format based on that recommendation with specific items that we're discussing for your consideration as a commission. So are you willing to take that on then on behalf of the commission or, and yes, so I'd be, I'd be do that to. coordination then uh, next week or next week, next month we'd have a specific recommendation then that we could discuss. Um, obtain public comment and make a, uh, a motion at that point in time to present it to City Council? Yes, I will. Okay. Is anybody, everybody okay with that? I, I think it's a good idea, actually. I think to the degree that we have a very specific formulation of our recommendation, it will make it easier for the City Council to adopt it rather than forcing them to take steps to make it specific. The, the problem, of course, is that this law, there's not, no, I don't think that there's a group in Sacramento that's pro-crime, that passed this law in order to inflict more crime on the communities. This is a state which has promised services way beyond their capacity to pay for them. And there's a, a death struggle now going on to see which services they're going to cut to try and balance their budget. So the question seems to me, the, the framing of it has to be that that this is a poor a discretionary choice where to save money, and that there might be uh, ways, alternative ways to save money without inflicting this kind of danger on the community. But it's a, uh, it's a state in trouble. And I agree with your with your points, and also uh, what uh, Councilman Chris said earlier, which is that I think that if we were to go to the City Council with a recommendation for study, that they rightfully would say let's take it back to the Criminal Justice Commission to do so. So um, it sounds like we're in agreement that that's the way we go forward. Yes. Uh, Mr. 
Mr. Chairman, I'd be glad to help uh, Commissioner Cabell with this if uh, okay. if he needs some help. Is, is there any other commissioners that want to? We can have up to three. You can. Uh, you can have up to three. If the two of you like to take that on, um, I would. I would just say, uh, since uh, Chairman Vieira can't be here to keep him informed, if he would like to be involved in the committee, that'd be fine. I don't think that that should get in the way of us getting the work done. Uh, coordinating schedules, as we find, is difficult with all of us and what we're doing during the day. Sometimes that sometimes fewer is better. Right. And then uh, the most important thing is to have it uh, ready for public scrutiny next month. Okay. Okay. So, uh, any other comments? You will have a uh, a new commissioner on uh, uh, Mr. Greer, and the new commissioner uh, will be from uh, probation. So maybe we can add him to the mix, and you can get in line with that. Okay. Outstanding. Any other uh, comments, suggestions? All right. With that, then let's uh, let's move on to uh, NB two discussion of ordinance relating to registered sex offenders. And again, I please. Uh... Lee, did you want to take the handle on that? Um, yes, I can. What I can bring forth is uh, Commissioner Shalat and Commissioner Capel and I went and visited with the uh, officer Ramirez from Ontario Police Department regarding um, some of the issues that were brought forward by Commissioner Capel as it related to registered sex offenders and specifically as it related to like Halloween or holiday issues um, and to look at the feasibility of adopting some of the similar policies in within the city by ordinance that relate to the policy that parole already has in place for parole supervised 290 offenders and actually um, it was really re refreshing to meet with Officer Ramirez. It's a well thought out ordinance and it goes beyond the scope of just holiday issues. They've actually did significant research that they provided to us and which um, Britt sent to you all of you yesterday and I just got it from her. That's why I sent it out to everybody um, regarding what in-depth research they had done what considerations they did with their city attorney and also with the district attorney's office in their county and as it related to this ordinance and where it already had been in practice and standing and challenges in other communities. Um, based on that, I think um, the commissioners probably want to relate some of the things that we got from that meeting with her and then their willingness and their department's city's willingness to work collectively with us and any other city that would be considering moving forward in this direction. So. Uh, one of the one of the main things that we found out was that um, it, it has been uh, they, they they used all of their their resources to f to find out that it has been challenged every every aspect of their ordinance was challenged so we don't have to worry about that um, one of the one of the uh, they also said that um, they can any sex offender as long as they're notified. So what they do is uh, any sex offender is affected by this. It doesn't go from the, the day they pass the ordinance on. So what we can do is when we pass this ordinance, it uh, automatically affects every 290 in the uh, in the city, and it encompasses them all as long as they've been notified. So we would have the, the deputies go out when they when they check their houses anyway, or when they when they re-register uh, on their annual registration, they will be notified that uh, the the Halloween ordeal where they they can't have the uh, the lights on and the children come into their houses in, in that respect. Uh, another area that we found that was that was very good is they had an ordinance that, that left the uh, the sex offenders not go into a public library. We're having problems with sex offenders being transient going into our libraries and looking at porno on the uh, on the, the monitors on the computer screens. So that would be a way that we can keep our sex offenders out of the libraries. Um, what was the other one? Other issues were public parks, public places parks. where children congregate, city events in which that are directed specifically towards where the majority of folks in attendance would be children. Um, some, and, it, and it's clearly defined in their ordinance how it is applied. They also provided us with a list of other cities that have adopted similar ordinances and counties throughout the state. So it's, you know, we're not reinventing the wheel here. There's already some substantial documentation as it relates to this. But it's a lot <laughs> larger encompassing issue beyond just what the LA County has currently, which only relates to child care centers and basic things within the law. This, this ordinance definitely takes it to another level 
as it relates to uh, other areas where children frequent within the community. Right, and one of the things was with the library, children congregate at libraries. So we really want to get the sex offenders out of the libraries. We want to get them out of the parks. And parole, that's what we do. We have conditions. We have zones on them that they cannot go into those areas. So they're basically paralleling what parole is doing at this point. And it's a, I, I think it's a good thing to keep sex offenders out of the parks and, and out, of, out, um, out of the libraries. Um, another thing we brought up, I don't know, did you check into that, the uh, uh, a sex offender being a, a Santa Claus uh, during Christmas. They had an ordinance with their business. Did, did you check into that, Lee? Right. Part of their business licensing process is that if you're going to have characters, and it, it be, is beyond just like the Santa Claus character, but a character event at, at an event, and this is for any business or anyone within the community, and if it was a grand opening for some shopping center or something, that there's a licensing issue for the state and they have to be DOJ checked and verify that they're not a sex offender and and go through the fingerprinting process within their city by ordinance on a business license issue. So they have to actually license the individual that's going to be in character as it relates to children. Did, did you check? Do we have anything in place here in the city? No, we don't. We don't. Not, as, not specifically addressing that issue. So would, would we be addressing that or does somebody else address that? I think that would be something that we'd want to incorporate because it is incorporated within Ordinance identifies it. There's some statement in there, and then relate that to the process for with our city attorney as it relates to business licensing. Um, there's nothing specific I saw as far as challenge here where that's been addressed as part of the licensing criteria, and that would be something for us to definitely discuss with the city attorney. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I think one of the, the most important things uh, when we met with uh, officer was that. There was a lot of time and research spent in in formulating this ordinance, and uh, it's as uh, Lee said, some of it's been tried, but most of it hasn't even been tried because of the preparation that she put into it and the research and the cases that were brought prior to them adopting this ordinance. And uh, I, uh, I, I, it was very thorough, and I was really impressed with. Uh, with the, the time spent to put this together, and, and I think it's something that we definitely uh, need to adopt in this city and, and uh, move forward with. Well, I need to apologize. It wasn't. I am part of that uh, committee of my business travel, so I was kind of reflecting on my own participation in this last comments that I was making, but I was unable to attend. But I really appreciate the hard work that's that's been done. My my question would be. Are we going to be in the position to put forth a recommendation for our March meeting, and how will that be coordinated between now and then, if that's the case? I think based on the contact now, probably what is appropriate for me to bring it forward to the city attorney in the context that the city, this particular city, has placed it to have uh, Mr. McEwen put his input on what issues he might be perceived to be problematic or things that maybe we need to do further research on. Um, it's something I definitely want to provide to uh, the captain as well as uh, Mr. Franklin for their review too. Okay, and then and maybe at that point I can report out to you based on their considerations as well as the city attorney's considerations, present that, and maybe bring Officer Ramirez as well. She's offered to come and do a presentation for the commission. If So if you would like her to come here, she'd be willing to do that along with the person who handles the registration for sex offenders in their city to discuss that with the commission and then from that point forward um, I believe then what we'd have to do is put it in whatever form we need to put it in for presentation for the City Council's consideration if you approve it in that. So a little optimistic then to have all that done by uh, our March meeting but yeah, can, can so, we put sir. it on the agenda in terms of having the presentations, preliminary results, uh, different points of view that we could then have some public discussion that would lead to say you know potentially in April um, vote no? Yeah, just on that, uh, April, we're not having a meeting, correct? Oh, that's right. We have no April vote. So, yeah, we're looking at May. May. So that's – we're kicking the can, Councilman. <laughs> <laughs> but I think in this case, it, it sounds like, uh, you know, just from due to inability to work it through the system, it's an important ordinance that we would be recommending and certainly we would like to, to take the time to give it the thought, consideration, and opportunity for public comment that it deserves would be my intuition on that. Is May a realistic time frame, do you think, Mr. DeRico, for accomplishing that, perhaps with a March meeting that we have uh, 
a presentation and uh, with May formulating something for a vote? I would I would have no problem. I, Officer Ramirez, I'll check her schedule, make sure she's available for March. Um, I think it would be beneficial for the commission to to talk to her and hear the issues that they've dealt with as far as this is concerned to see how depth it, it is. So see where your comfort level is at. In the meantime, I will make appointment with Mr. Franklin as well as Captain Johnson to have that discussion and provide them with a copy of what they've done there and for their review as well. And then to Dave McEwen, our city attorney. So since we're naming names, does that uh, time frame seem reasonable to you gentlemen as well? To have those initial discussions? I think for initial, I might have our appellate department look at it as well. So it might uh, it might be a little time sensitive, but we'll certainly uh, try and work within those parameters. It, w it would be nice if we could have the, at least some preliminary discussions in March so that we have something to work with and for the public to comment, knowing that in April uh, we're dark anyway for elections. So therefore, we're looking at... Uh, April or May before we'd be able to do anything that gives us two months to to work it through the legal systems uh, three months from now which seems like probably sufficient time unless I'm misreading it agreed or okay we all okay with that yeah. all right so great very good thank you any other comments on okay so uh, hearing none we're going to go back to uh, commission staff presentations. We've done the, the monthly crime statistics, so we're at arrest statistics from the Sheriff's Department. Thank you. I just have uh, a couple of uh, investigations of note that I wanted to talk about. No arrest statistics. Uh, we broke up a couple of theft rings this uh, past several months, actually. Uh, one was a uh, burglary theft ring. Uh, that uh, started in November on the west side of Lancaster. The uh, burglary suppression team conducted uh, two separate search warrants and uh, arrested uh, several suspects, uh, several of which were gang members, uh, recovered a bunch of property, and uh, firearms, camera, jewelry, gaming systems, and uh, some property from a San Bernardino burglary. So that was kind of a far-reaching uh, event. And then we had uh, a local uh, group of thieves that were uh, stealing from Walmart, uh, breaking into the battery storage on the exterior of the locations. And uh, they were going to uh, uh, areas as far as San Bernardino and, uh, and far north as Bakersfield. Uh, our detectives actually broke the case uh, working with Walmart loss prevention and uh, over a two-week period conducted surveillance and actually uh, arrested three suspects with uh, a truckload of batteries after they had committed three thefts. So uh, we're continuing to assist on that as well. And then uh, also I'd like to note that uh, the uh, Lancaster's most wanted uh, input into the local media uh, has resulted in uh, 61 arrests out of the 89 suspects that we uh, uh, showcased last year. So we're at about 69% there with the public's help. And that's all I have. Well, it's outstanding. It's good to know when things work. Yeah. Any, co any comments from uh, commissioners? Questions? So moving on, California Highway Patrol. Good morning. Good morning. Um, for, for the Highway Patrol, uh, citations for, for the month of January were about 2,700 citations. Um, DUI uh, arrests were up by 23% from, from the year before. Unfortunately, we had uh, two fatal collisions result, resulting in three deaths uh, in the month of January. Um, Mr. Franklin brought up a good point about the uh, about the four DUIs. Education has always been one of the biggest things that we try to do with the Highway Patrol. Uh, I don't know if everybody here is familiar with the every 15 minute program. Every 15 minutes uh, there's a DUI related accident someplace in the United States. Um, Highland High School has taken on that responsibility this year. Um, for those of you not familiar with it, what it basically does, it takes Highland High School, they have a stage collision at, at the school itself, and it takes these kids through the process, including uh, notifications to parents of death of their classmates, of their, of their children. Um, the kids actually see it happen. They see the emergency personnel arriving at the, at, at the school. Uh, they take them away in ambulances. 
notifications are made by either the Sheriff's Department or the Ohio Patrol at the parents' residence where they're taken to the local hospitals and told that their son or daughter has just died. Um, it's very, it has a great deal of impact on, on the community. It's a ripple effect. Um, they go beyond that and they don't stop there. They, um, they have these parents write obituaries for their children and they're read the following day in school. These kids are, are, have no contact with their parents for 24 hours. They're classmates, they have no cell phones, and they're kept at, at a local uh, uh, location overnight. And these obituaries are read in an assembly. Um, I don't think that there's been one here in the city of Lancaster yet. I highly encourage any of you who know somebody at these schools, we try to get the word out. It takes up a lot of time the kids actually put this thing together. They get the volunteers to come out. They get uh, the, the, uh, the, the local agencies, the, the sheriff's department, the fire department, ambulance companies and the hospitals involved in this. And this is actually filmed and documented uh, for them to view on the 12th. And it shows the stages that you go through when, when something like this happens. Uh, it's a very powerful presentation. Uh, takes up a lot of time. This will happen actually on April 11th, um, where they will actually have this uh, program at Highland High School, and on the 12th they will have their assembly. Have a meeting today with those who will be participating at Highland High School, and we will go over a lot of the details that we need to to address before this thing happens. If you have not ever seen a program like this, I, I encourage you to come out, take a few minutes of your time. Um, I will not be here next month. Um, I have uh, another appointment in Sacramento. Um, uh, my lieutenant, Rob Lund, I'll ensure that he brings the, uh, the time and location for each of you and, uh, and to be able to give it to you so that if you can come, please do. Please do come. But that's all we have, unless there's any question. Well, thank you. It sounds like the, we've had presentations before about the, the anti-bullying program, the Not In My Town, uh, here as well as the City Council and how that's led. It's had a multiplier effect with other schools and gotten a lot of attention. It sounds like it has the same potential. And so the more we know about it, the better, and then maybe look towards uh, May-June uh, presentation uh, either here or at the City Council meeting. Uh, about the results of that program because it sounds like something that's uh, this you know you can't hear it without envisioning it and uh, if you're a parent that's a tough thing well I tell you what we can what we can probably do is is bring the results of that the, the Highland High School is going to film and edit their own program and I can bring that in for you for everybody to see if you're not able to make it so that at least uh, you can see what with the efforts that are put into this program. I think it, that's a great idea because you have the benefit as well as the, the presentation would then be taped to be available on the city's website that those that can't make the meetings, which oftentimes mm -hmm. being at 10 o'clock in the morning is difficult for citizens to do, they would have the opportunity to see it at another time. And um, you never know how you're going to impact people. Very way. true. Any comments, uh, questions? Uh, thank you for that. Move on to uh, District Attorney update. Uh, Stephen Franklin, Deputy District Attorney. Uh, for the month of January uh, 2012, um, the Antelope Valley, and as always, there's the caveat that uh, this is the entire Antelope Valley, is what my statistics are. I don't. It's not broken down into just Lancaster, but it's Lancaster, Palmdale, and the other outlying areas. But we filed 306 uh, felony complaints for uh, that month. And um, what's interesting is just to do a quick comparison with the rest of the county, generally we're one of the higher, but uh, for January um, there's uh, several other uh, area branch uh, offices that are the same or higher. Um, the airport, which has Beverly Hills, Santa Monica, uh, and surrounding areas there, has more at 309. Van Nuys has more at 314. Um, Compton has quite a bit more at 479. Uh, Long Beach has more at 330. Norwalk has more. 
at 432 and Pomona has more at 328. So I don't know if that's an aberration or if uh, hopefully we'll continue to see that where there's um, <clears throat> we're not at the uh, on the top end of, of filings. Uh, as far as misdemeanors, we uh, filed 617 uh, for the month of uh, January. And that's it. Any questions on that? Uh, normally at this time we would, we would have reports on our neighborhood impact program, business watch, public safety update. Um, unless there's something pressing, uh, there is going to be a presentation by the mayor and the state of the city here in about 10 minutes in a different location. And I know that there are people who are either interested and or obligated to be there. So um, I'd like to, if we could, table those three items till next month if there's no objections. Hearing none, uh, I'd like to go to the public business from the floor, non-agendized items. We have no speaker cards. Thank you. Uh, commissioner comments? And then with that, uh, we are adjourned at about 11.18. Thank you very much for being here today.